the fantasy ad with Jonathan Chan, Kevin Quo, Richard Seville. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fantasy Edge, uh, presented by Fantasy Six Pack.net. My name is Jonathan Chan. Uh, I will be joined, as always, by Richard Seville and Kevin Wo. This week, we'll be taking you through the Week Two review and what was one of the most injury-filled weeks that uh, I can recall, anyways. Uh, Richard, you've been watching the NFL a lot longer than I have. Uh, can you recall any week that was uh, as injury-filled as this one? No, I way back in the uh, day. This is going back a number of years. Uh, when I first started with F6P, I used to write the injury report. It used to come out on Thursdays. And a week like this would be something like impossible. Like, you know, you might see half a dozen to maybe eight at tops, really. But I think we had like upwards of like 20 players that are more or less fantasy relevant within the top 60 of... Uh, of each uh, of each position, you know, in, in, in various groupings. But uh, no, no, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, we had some huge names go down this week. Kevin, you're a betting man. Any uh, any bad beats with the uh, with all the injuries going on? Um, no, I I knew I was going to be busy this weekend, so I kind of stayed off the the bets. I I just went two and zero on my weeks. Took a lot of easy favorites. Um, I mean, the one game I did almost lose on was the, I didn't almost lose on it because they crushed the Jets, but I got a little nervous with all the injuries, and then I realized, oh, wait, I'm playing the, the Jets, so never mind. It doesn't matter. That's uh, always an easy bet to make, the Jets losing, especially with Adam Gase is still the head coach. Uh, so like I said, we're going to be going through uh, most of the injuries, or all the injuries from this week. Uh, the, the format might be a little bit different. We're going to go through each uh, player injury individually and then discuss the associated waiver pick. Up so you can uh, if you're searching for a specific player you can go through and uh, and look for them. We'll start off with the uh, the biggest star to or two of the biggest stars get hurt this week. Uh, Saquon Barkley and Christian McCaffrey. I guess we'll start with Saquon because he's out for the year with a torn ACL. Uh, Richard, are you going to add Dion Lewis? If I can, I probably uh, I would probably try and go for Wayne Gallman as well. Wayne Gallman, that is. I yeah, it's it's going to be a committee no matter what, but. I think you got to pick up one or two of those guys. I think Dion Lewis gets the lead, but uh, I think I think Gallman's going to mix in a little bit more than he does when than when he does when uh, when Barkley's healthy. And Kevin, with the Giants struggling uh, with their offensive line as it is, and even Saquon was struggling to produce, is is, is it even worth putting a large uh, percentage of your budget on a guy like Lewis or Gallman or even Devonta Freeman if he signs there? Uh, I mean, you have to just because you know it's it's so hard to get a starting running back in any offense but yeah like you said I mean, you really just got to temper your expectations with whoever you get they're obviously I mean Saquon was having a hard time doing anything uh, in that offense so uh, it's going to be tough for any of these replacement guys too that's true did you know uh, against the the opening week um, Saquon 10 of his 15 carries went for negative yardage yeah and that's like not his fault at all that's just offensive line not blocking or play calling being really bad like that's you know 10 of 15 if you have a couple negative runs you can say oh maybe he was doing too much which was one of the knocks on him coming out of college but 10 of 15 is just outrageous so yeah and i guess that kind of affects our our thoughts about Dion lewis but i guess you you gotta pick him up though just in case right in case the line gels at some point i guess wouldn't it be yeah even without the line gelling i think lewis has a higher I guess more potential than that offense because he's a better uh, pass catching back than than Gallman is. So I guess PPR formats, Lewis is definitely the guy. Uh, ceiling probably won't be there, but he'll at least have a, a few receptions a game to to kind of support that. Uh, let's move on to Christian McCaffrey. Uh, high ankle sprain. I believe he's out four to six weeks, which is the initial uh, the initial timetable there. Uh, Kevin, are you putting any stock into the into Mike Davis as as the next guy, or is this going to be you know the Teddy Bridgewater show moving forward? And don't like don't laugh at Mike Davis, man. Like he's 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 carved out a nice little career for himself. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, I I don't know I don't I don't know what you want me to say like Mike Davis is the same he's a he's a career journeyman he's just a guy um, again it's one of those things where if you really need the running back depth you pick him up see maybe you know see what he does maybe but McCaffrey's coming back in four to six weeks to take that job uh, one thing that was actually kind of interesting that I saw was that Curtis Samuel actually carried the ball a few times um, as like an actual runner not just like on end rounds and things um, so. 
I mean, there's kind of a chance that, you know, he gets a little bit more involved. He was going to be my drop candidate this week, but I think with the injury of Christian McCaffrey, he kind of becomes like a little bit of a do-it-all player in that offense. But I don't know. Mike Davis, I'm not rushing to pick him up. But if I'm, I can drop like Sonny Michelle for him, I'll do that. Yeah, R- Richard, even with McCaffrey out, uh, Mike Davis only had one carry, but he had eight catches. Is that something you think that's going to continue? Just uh, he'll be more in the passing game, more so than actual a, a rusher? Um, I think that comes up a little bit, obviously. Uh, but I'm going to – it'll be interesting to see how they uh, mix and match the uh, the – the overall team with uh, in the backfield. I think you're looking at some kind of committee. I think Reggie Bonifon comes in. Is he healthy? I'm not even sure if he's healthy, but Reggie Bonifon is the other is the other guy. I think he'll get a lot of run. But I, if you're expecting um, production, uh, I don't know about that. I think they're going to have to get Teddy Bridgewater throwing. Yeah, I think Mike Davis is one of those you kind of have to add him just based on the circumstances, but you can't really feel confident starting him. This is a it's a bad situation all around. Maybe flex. Uh, it could be, but you don't know how much you can count on uh, the actual workload. But anyways, uh, let's move on to the 49ers who suffered many, many injuries this week. Let's start with uh, Raheem Mostert. Uh, suffered a knee injury, probably going to be out two to four weeks is what I read yesterday. I don't know if that's been updated uh, with a knee sprain, I believe it was. Uh, of course, he started off the game, the first play of the game with an 80-yard touchdown run. Uh, so at least he provides some fantasy uh, value there. Tevin Coleman also went down with a knee injury. He's going to be out multiple weeks, leaving uh, Jarek McKinnon as the as the lead back in San Francisco. Uh, Kevin, how much budget are you putting down on uh, Jarek McKinnon after he scored a touchdown this week? Yeah, McKinnon, uh, he scored a touchdown on a on a 55 yard run. So um, again, we ha- you, you got to take it with a grain of salt that this is the Jets. And I mean, we saw Mostert did it too, so it's not like it was. I'm not saying that any back could have gone in and done it, but again, you have to look at it as it was the Jets, um, who who basically have no linebackers since they all opted out due to COVID. Um, McKinnon is someone I'd probably spend maybe if I really need a running back, I'd probably be somewhere comfortable around like 35 percent, something like that, because I do think he will have a role even when he moster comes back. The only thing is that Tevin Coleman is there. Oh, actually, Tevin Coleman is hurt too, huh? He is. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll bump that up to about uh, forty-five, fifty. I, I think that's about fair. I think McKinnon is. He's shown that he's he's kind of healthy, and at worst, when he comes back, he's a decent RB two on a run heavy team. So uh, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with uh, McKinnon. He's probably one of my top two waiver targets this week. Right. And Richard, with Jimmy Garoppolo getting hurt as well, um, do you think that Nick Mullins coming in, if he does get the start this Sunday, uh, do you think Mullins pushes it toward more carries for McKinnon, or is he going to throw a little bit more than Jimmy's used to doing? I think, you know, uh, Nick Mullins is actually one of the uh, better backups in the in the NFL, so I think they'll, they'll, they'll game plan him uh, a f- pretty good sizable amount of... Uh, of pass attempts probably nothing over 30 but i think i think he'll get uh i think he'll get they'll uh unleash him a little bit for in the passing game all right uh i guess we have one more uh running back who suffered an injury this week uh, rams rookie cam Akers uh is dealing with a hamstring injury i believe uh that let daryl henderson jr uh post high sleeper from last season pick up the pick up the slack averaged over six yards a carry and uh, performed well. Uh, got did a better than did, did, a, did a better job than uh, Malcolm Brown this week against the Eagles. Uh, Kevin is Henderson the new guy in this uh, in this committee, or is it just going to be back and forth all year long? Yeah, I, I I I thought I had it figured out last week. I thought you know Malcolm Brown kind of distinguished himself. Henderson uh, didn't do much, but it turns out that it might have just been that Henderson really wasn't healthy. He was really bothered by that thigh injury. So. Now that he's healthy and with Akers out probably a week or two at least with a broken rib, um, I would say Henderson offers more upside for that Rams offense than Malcolm Brown. So it kind of makes sense if he ends up being the guy there. But um, I I just wouldn't expect him to be the type of running back who gets, you know, a a bell cow's workload. Um, Malcolm Brown is still going to factor in. He'll have better games. Not that I'm saying you can start Malcolm Brown, but if you pick up uh, Daryl Henderson, and he is my, when I mentioned my two top waiver wire targets, he's the other one. Um, And I'd rather have him over McKinnon. Uh, You just can't expect him to have these kind of performances every week. And Richard, when Akers does get healthy, where do you think he fits in alongside Henderson and, and Brown? I think it'll probably be the same as it was like in week one. I think, uh, Acres between the twenties and, uh, it'll be, 
uh, a mix in between Henderson and Brown. I think it's a toss up of who gets the goal line, but I have a feeling uh, Akers might get just so he can have his uh, NFL touchdown. You know, so he'll probably he'll probably figure in some some goal line carries, but I think it's pretty much between Henderson and Brown. But um, it's kind of cert- we're kind of back to Brown being behind Henderson again, unfortunately, for those who picked him up last week. Okay, well, that sorts out the uh, the main running backs here. Let's move on to some wide receivers. Uh, Cortland Sutton, receiver for the Broncos, uh, struggling with a shoulder injury uh, throughout the week, was deemed healthy, came in, and immediately uh, tore up his knee. He's going to be out for the season as well. Uh, Kevin, where does the Broncos offense go now that Drew Locke and Cortland, Cortland Sutton are going to be out for a significant period of time? Yeah, so so that's the issue is, uh, I mean, I would bump up Jerry Judy just and and no fan by default, but... Now we're working with Jeff Driscoll, so I, I really don't know what to think. Um, I would just say that I don't really want either of them. They're not even. They're going to have good weeks, obviously, because that's just kind of the nature of the game. But uh, neither of them are going to be anyone you can count on. Um, I, I'm just kind of going to stay away from the passing attack here. Yep. And Richard, is there? I guess with with Driscoll, then he's a bit of a runner. He doesn't. He has a pretty safe floor with his running ability. Any thought to him as a QB two? streamer and good matchups oh boy that's uh, <laughs> that's hey, asking a lot qb15 in his last three starts uh, that that may that, that may be okay uh but i think it's a wait and see to see who he connects with and see if he makes a connection it's too early to put him in the streaming conversation fair enough um i guess the other another big wide receiver injury here uh Devonte adams uh, went out with a another. I think I think I believe he was another hamstring injury. Um, not too serious. I believe he's going to play next Sunday. He said he wanted to come back in. Any worry about him being a little limited uh, next week, Kevin? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, the hamstring injuries are always tough. Um, we've seen it over the years with you know AJ Green, Julio Jones, uh, all these big time wide receivers can be severely limited by a hamstring injury. So I, I think you've kind of just got to play it by ear and, and see how he's responding in practice but at the same time if he's going to play you've got to play him I, yeah. I just don't really I, I probably wouldn't play him in dfs or anything like that but if you draft him where you drafted him if he plays he's in your lineup yeah but by uh the one thing i've been hearing by ear as you say is is that um they held him out as uh precautionary because uh they were i guess they wanted to uh not not push the envelope so it might look like he's okay for week three yeah, Richard, you're right. I, I think I read that he, he did ask to go back in the game, so he believes he's healthy at least. Uh, if he does suffer a setback in practice this week and, you know, is limited or can't play, uh, who, who's the guy there? Who's the, uh, who's the waiver ad? Uh, if he can't play, yeah. uh, there's really no waiver ad because Lazard and MVS are, are capable enough. And I don't think, uh, there's enough, uh, room for the third wide receiver. Um, to, to get anything so if he's out you're not you're not really picking up anybody uh just for spec if you if you look through the uh if you look through the list you can sort of you know pick and choose but i don't think a third wide is uh all that uh, imperative to go out and grab if adams is out fair enough uh let's take a look here um let's go aj brown uh his injury kind of came out of nowhere prior to week two uh we heard something that was going on in but prior to week one he played looked a little ginger and then was ruled out pretty early for week two uh cory davis is the uh, next man up on the wide receiver depth chart but john new smith looked like he took over took over the uh, the red zone and most of the targets kevin is cory davis finally uh gonna be <laughs> a viable wide receiver option yeah, yeah. <laughs> can we talk about johnny smith i'd rather just talk about johnny smith all right all right you that, that dude is gonna be a top seven tight end going for i'm almost i'm very confident in that whether or not aj brown comes back johnny smith was one of my favorite breakout tight ends going into the season uh just the athleticism the opportunity there um in an offense that is is pretty favorable for matchups um I was pretty high on him as, you know, one of those deep tight end sleepers. So I'm pretty happy that happened. I guess I'll answer the Corey Davis question. Uh, you can play him as like a wide receiver four, even a wide receiver three if you're desperate with injuries. Just, I mean, come on. You know what you're getting with him. If he disappoints you, you're going to look at yourself in the mirror and be like, yeah, that sounds about right. You're, then, you're playing with house money if you start Corey Davis. Then that's the, the Devontae Ar- Adams argument, though. Uh, not Devontae Adams, but Devontae Parker. 
Yeah, the high draft pick, the pedigree, the athleticism, just, you know, kind of working out. I could see it. He could be this year's Devontae Parker. At the same time, I'm just not counting on it, especially since when A.J. Brown inevitably comes back, um, I think he, he goes back to being, you know, option number two or three. Well, I want to go back to Jono Smith just for a second because he's fun to talk about. And and he's one of those guys that if you waited where you actually got the bargain from on the, on the tight end, and uh, I waited uh, in in drafts to get him in both in the, uh, Scott Fish and our league as well. I waited for John o. Smith. I thought I'll, I'll, I'll get I'll get a good I'll get a good top ten tight end cheap. And it's turning out that way. That's a nice pick. Um, I guess now I haven't heard how long Brown's going to be out, but they ruled him out quite early. Uh, so I guess if he's out again, like you guys said, uh, John o. Smith is going to be the higher ceiling guy, and Davis is going to be. Wide receiver four, wide receiver three if he catches a touchdown. But even without Brown this week, he, he didn't have a ton of targets. Uh, Smith out-targeted him. So, again, not not somebody you can rely on. Um, Richard, why don't, you, why don't you pick one of the injuries here? Let's see who else we want to talk about today. Uh, I will talk about, how about Tyrod Taylor. I'll talk about Tyrod Taylor. Uh, Tyrod Taylor um, missed the entire game. Um, some sort of chest injury going, like, or some, something to do with that. Um, he took an injection and he had an adverse effect. But now, the, the, the coach says there's no, uh, quarterback controversy, but I want there to be a controversy because I liked what I saw of, uh, Justin Herbert. I want Herbert in there. I think Herbert's, Herbert looked better, more dynamic, and he almost won the game in overtime. So, I mean, I, if, if Tyrod is in, I ask myself if Tyrod was in there, would the game have been as close? And I, and I have to say maybe, but probably not, because I just I just like the way uh, Herbert looked. Now, granted, and and Joe Bond pointed this out, and we all know this that defenses do catch up to rookie quarterbacks. They get once they get the film because they weren't expecting uh, Herbert to start. So um, yeah, uh, the Tyrod Taylor. So whether he comes back, I don't know, but it. Sounds like the coach is saying they're going to continue going with Tyrod, but I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me, but you never know. Coach speak is, you know, Kev, you know. Uh, Kevin, uh, if you're an Austin Eckler or a Joshua Kelly owner, you want Justin Herbert back back under center, don't you? Um, I guess. I mean, it's it's just a one-game sample. Like, I think, like, I, I guess, like Joe said, um, defenses will be able to better prepare with Herbert. Um, I think preparation is something that's really downplayed in the NFL. Like, literally, I, I, I read somewhere that Herbert found out, like, minutes before kickoff that he was going to start the game. Um, and it must have been a shock for this, the defenders to go out and do that, too. Like, honestly, I would bet a lot of that the defenders did not even know, and probably the defense coordinator didn't even know what, like, Herbert could do. So it really it really kind of, you know, it, it kind of screws up their complete game plan if you pull a switcheroo like that. So I wouldn't expect Herbert to, you know, be able, if he's named the starter early in the week, to be able to come in and do anything like this. Even then, defenses are going to prepare for him. So I, I, I don't really have a preference, I guess, if you're an Eckler owner. I'd prefer to have Herbert since he'll at least throw the ball to a running back. But other than, other than that, I, I'm not really going to take too much from it. All right. And I guess with that, you can uh, you, you can pick an injury to talk about now. Yeah, sure. So uh, an injury that I was really disappointed to see, not really like the best player, but Paris Campbell was a guy who I had pegged for a breakout and he was having a really good season um, or had a good week one, caught six, nine targets for like 97 yards or something like that. And in week two, he went down with an, uh, probably a season ending AGCL injury. Uh, it's just disappointing to see from a young guy who missed his first season with injury. Now he's going to miss his second season with injury. Um as far as fantasy out, outlook, uh, I think the Colts probably won't miss too much of a beat with Michael Pittman in there. Um, he caught four of six targets once uh, Campbell left. Uh, but um, yeah, Campbell was a guy who was who was kind of on the cusp of breaking out, and, and I guess we'll see what Pittman can do now. Richard, any thought to Zach Pascal uh, as another receiving option in, uh, in Indy? Yeah, I think he's a definite pickup if he's available on your waiver wire. Definitely got to pick him up because he'll be the clear number two. And, you know, T.Y. Hilton isn't exactly, uh, you know, Mr. Healthy himself. He he gets injured quite a bit, maybe not as devastatingly as uh, Campbell does, but um, he still, nevertheless, you've got to, uh, I think you've got to uh, pick up the, uh, especially with a quarterback like Phillip Rivers, who likes to, uh, one of the gun, one of the old gunslingers, uh, it's best to pick up uh, Zach Pascal. And and there is an uptick for Pittman, but mm, I'm kind of wondering about 
about his usage because after Campbell left, he wasn't um, he wasn't a favorite target of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of 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 Rivers. He was looking for Mo Ali Cox of all people, really. Yeah, uh, Mo Ali Cox had what, five catches over a hundred yards. Uh, I don't think many people predicted he would do that. I mean, he was a sneaky, you know, a little favorite pickup uh, close to the end of the week, but I don't think anybody thought he would do that. Uh, especially against the Vikings, but I guess their their defense hasn't been great over the first two weeks. Uh, I guess the real beneficiary in all this is Jonathan Taylor, but that's a story for another day. Uh, I guess I'll pick one now. Let's go George Kittle. Uh, he missed week two uh, with with an injury as well. Uh, Jordan Reed stepped in and it looked he looked like the Jordan Reed of old. Uh, caught seven passes, fifty yards, two touchdowns uh, for just a broken down 49ers uh, receiving core. That's you know got Mohamed Sanu out there uh, and. Kittle, he's not confirmed to play next week, but I think he said he he aims to. Obviously, all players aim to play uh, if they're kind of on the bubble. But if Kittle doesn't play, you you kind of have to put Reed in your lineup, don't you, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, with the tight end position as always up in the air, you, you at least get a guy in in a tight end friendly offense who has talent. You know, he's shown he's done it before. And as long as he's on the field and healthy, it looks like he's going to produce. Um, again, grain of salt, Jets stink, no linebackers, traded Jamal Adams like a month before the season started. So uh, grain of salt, but uh, Jordan Reed is going to be a better option than like rolling out like Gronk or, or and someone like that. Yeah, for sure. And as you said, Richard, uh, the injury issue with uh, it's pretty ironic here that Reed performed on, during a week that everyone else is getting injured, right? Yes. Uh <laughs> <laughs> But but not surprising. Um, I mean, it's the scheme of the 49ers. Uh, you kind of could expect that, and you know, Reed's a tried and tested. And I mean, when he was in Washington, he was he was solid when he was on the field. The only thing with uh, Reed is that he's pretty much like he's running out of uh, concussion counts. You know, like and uh, so it's getting longer and longer for him to get back from concussions. So I don't know any any time he gets concussed. So, he, but I don't know. You stick him out there until he, you know, until he falls. And uh, besides, it won't be long before George Kittle is back. So get use out of him, especially against uh, you know a weak opponent. For sure, uh, I just saw the 49ers believe Kittle will play Week Three. So all this discussion on Jordan Reed might have been for naught. But it's always good to know just in case. Yeah. Uh, Richard, why don't you give us a, an injury to take away here? All right, uh, let me see. Who shall I pick? Um. I'll take uh, somebody who played on Thursday night, CJ Uzuma, out for the season. Uh, it's quite interesting about who uh, I even I've already forgotten the guy's name. Kevin, can you help me out? Drew Who's Sample. It? Drew Sample. Uh, I think he's a guy you gotta. Yeah, he's in. He's in the uh, waiver list. Um, again, with tight ends at a premium and Uzuma getting uh, plenty of looks from Burrow. Um, I would say, yeah, sure. I think Drew Sample's a, a good pickup and you probably won't have to pay a lot of fab for him either. So I, 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 I put a few bucks on, uh, on, on picking up Drew Sample and putting him in your lineup. You know, it's, it's not a bad, uh, the worst, the worst that can happen is that you stash him and you, and you put him back out in the pile again, but, uh, definitely worth it just to, uh, stash and, he's more, more like a stash and see, but, but you, um, I'd be hesitant about putting him in the tight end if you have a better option, though. Uh, Kevin Sample had nine targets uh, on Thursday night against the Browns. Is that just a Browns thing, or do you think that Burrow's going to have to target his uh, his uh, his receivers and his tight ends this often? Yeah, nine targets sounds pretty impressive, but when you really look at it, Burrow threw the ball 61 times, so nine targets is a 14.8% target share, which is yeah. less impressive sounding. Um, I doubt Burrow's going to throw the ball 60-plus <laughs> times a game. More than likely, he's going to throw the ball around, uh, let's say, 35 times a game. So at that target share, then you're looking at, you know, uh, five, five targets a game. And is Drew Sample really talented enough to really pay off at five targets a game? Like, he's, I- I'm confident saying he's not better than Boyd. He's not better than Green. He's not better than probably even John Ross. So while you do have to pick him up as on speculation, just because, of course, we all pick up all starters if we can, um, I wouldn't spend too much on him. Yeah, get him cheap. Yeah, get him cheap. Get him cheap. Don't spend too much fat. I wouldn't spend more than like ten bucks on him, unless I was like super desperate at tight end. But then you know, go 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 get someone like Jordan Reed. Go get someone like Mo Alley Cox. Get someone in in a better offense with not as many options. All right. Um. Well, I guess I think that ends. Oh, well, we talked about Mo Alley Cox already, so we don't need to talk about Jack Doyle. Uh. 
Let's go into another oft injured one, probably the next biggest injury. Will Fuller mysteriously left after the half with uh, with a hamstring strain, which is, you know, not totally out of the ordinary for Will Fuller. Uh, normally, he lasts a little bit longer before getting hurt, but this time it was the middle of week two. Richard, uh, Brandon Cooks look good in his stead. Is, uh, is Cooks back on the, uh, the trust list here? I think he has to be. I think you can still f- flex him or, or, uh, or as your third wide receiver. Um, I think Houston are still sort of like in preseason mode. They're not, they haven't really sorted out their, their offense. The, they, they look a little lost without Hopkins out there. It doesn't seem, it, it seems like, um, uh, like, like Deshaun Watson is looking for uh, Hopkins and he's just not, where's, where's my Hopkins? Where is he? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, but he had Will Fuller and Will Fuller was his comfort zone. So, um, Watson has no comfort zone if, if, if Will Fuller's out because you could see in, in work, in week one where, uh, you know, it was, he was his go-to guy and nobody else got anything. But I think, um, I think the man that, 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 that's looking good and it could be a su- big surprise is Cobb of all people. Yeah, I was going to say, Kevin, you're a, you were a big Randall Cobb guy preseason. Uh, what's the arrow looking like now? Yeah, it, it's not too surprising. Uh, I mean, Cobb is, is a possession receiver type. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, as talented as he is, is a possession receiver. He's not, you know, a burner. He's not that kind of he's a contested catch kind of guy a route technician randall cobb can kind of do the same thing um i I would just say one thing about this texans offense though is that uh, i went back and watched both games because i have deshaun watson in in a couple leagues i'm trying to figure out what to do with him and i don't think he's actually been playing very badly i think his i think the problem is that his offensive first of all he's played the kansas city chiefs and the baltimore ravens and those two teams have just boat raced him like he is being put in in just 15 point holes as soon as he touches the field he gets like three drives playing at like a neutral neutral offensive game plan and then he has to play catch up and his offensive line is terrible so he's under siege constantly by these defenses who can just pin their ears back and go after him because they're up 15 up 20 so it's it's i think it's really hard to judge deshaun watson at the point um that being said like uh, if the discussion is about cooks and cobb like yeah i think those guys are are probably startable wide receiver fours but i'm reserving real judgment until they actually play like a mediocre team for once (laughs) yeah that's good yeah who would have thought texans would struggle without one of the top three wide receivers in the league (laughs) um all right we have a few injuries left here are any of these uh we have brashad perryman david njoku sammy watkins uh duke johnson are any of these guys really worth discussing with the backups? Because I know I have something to say about Austin Hooper, but I'll I can leave that for a little bit later. Uh, anybody want to talk about Sammy Watkins and the possibility of Mikael Hardman getting unleashed? No, man, Sammy, Sammy, Sammy killed me, man. Uh, Joe, uh, I went on Joe's uh, Joe's podcast and someone asked, uh, should I start Edelman or Sammy? Oh. And in, my, in my haste, I said Sammy, and Joe immediately texted me like when after the Chiefs game and said, uh, dude. You suck at this. <laughs> You're right. My bad. <laughs> that was follower, bad. Kevin. Come on. How could you do that? <laughs> that is a bad one. <laughs> but yeah, geez, that happens. All right. Richard, anybody you want to talk about? Uh, Brashad Perryman or Sterling Shepard? Um, can we talk about the 49ers defense, the DST? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, I think it's Nick Bosa is like um, a massive loss to that front. That, that front is a monster front. And without, uh, Nick Bosa, I think teams are going to be able to run on them a little bit better than they have in the past. And there's a little bit of value, uh, dropped in. Now we don't normally in fantasy football, we don't trade DSTs for anybody. So you're not, you can't trade, <laughs> you can't trade a defense, but, um, I think it hurts their defense because there's several other players too. I, um, Kevin always knows all the names of the defense, but they, I think there were three others, Kev. Uh, yeah. So they lost Nick Bosa or Joey Bosa. I, I never know. Nick Bosa, right? Yeah. Um, they lost Nick Bosa. They lost Solomon Thomas. They lost, oh, shoot. Um, I think That's they fair. lost one of their, did they lose Fred Warner? I don't think so. Uh, but anyways, the, the defense got gashed with injuries though. That's the bottom oh, line. Oh, yeah, they lost Sherman. They lost D Ford. Ah, Sherman. That's right, Sherman. Yeah. D Ford was the one I, I couldn't think of, yeah. So yeah. they lost D Ford and Sherman. I don't know how how severe those injuries are, but, like, oh, it's going to be bad. Yeah, so if you're uh, starting the DST, um, basically, 
um, temper expectations for for the next while until some some of them get back. I, I'm kind of interested. Uh, I haven't heard about Bosa. Is he out for the season or is he going to be? Yep, he's done torn ACL. Torn ACL. Terrible. Just yeah. terrible. There were six torn ACLs yesterday. Six. Whew. Yeah, it was like I said, just unbelievable day injury wise. Yeah, I'm I'm very nervous that um, this is going to continue because as the stress piles up during the season, it's only going to get worse and worse. We're only in week two. Yeah. Well, we were discussing this briefly in the F6P chat early today, and Joe brought up the point that is this because there was no camp, no preseason no games? Reason. Correct. That is uh, just... John Harbaugh's theory. He thinks you can't properly get conditioned if you're not doing football things. You know, you can run, you can jog, you can do whatever. But if you're not playing football, uh, when it comes time to make football moves, like you're seeing the players at the most athletic positions get hurt. You're not seeing offensive linemen and stuff going down. You're seeing you're seeing cornerbacks, you're seeing wide receivers, you're seeing pass rushers, middle linebackers, safeties, these guys who have to, you know, really do athletic feats. Like these are the guys who are going down because they're just not game speed is just different. Everyone always says that game speed is different. Yeah. I think a lot of this can make my kind of to conditioning as well. Without the full camp, you know, without you know that exactly. football shape they can get into, they get fatigued and half an inch, you know, step to the left your ankles out, you know, half an inch to the right and your knees gone. It's just exactly. one of those things you can't, like you said, you can't prepare for without actual football games, which tough situation with what's going on, but it's tough to say. And, and we haven't even had any COVID things yet. Like it's going to be a rough season. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to our uh, observations. What did we learn this week? Richard, uh, outside of injuries, what did you learn this week? Uh, I think what I got a better grip on is that um, I don't think um, – DJ Shark is as distant from the other receivers on the Jaguars as I thought. I think that I think that um, like Keelan Cole and Lavisca Chanel, uh, those, those guys are, are. He's not as far ahead of them in the. Uh, there is a pecking order, and I guess you got to put Shark at the top, but he's at the top. But it's it's not really his. Uh, it's not really his show. I think it's, I think there's, um, I kind of thought that he'd kind of like be the, the WR1, like, and solid in the, and it was like the rest behind him, but it's not, they're actually a lot closer, uh, to him than I thought. And Gardner Minshew has kind of proven that. And actually Keelan Cole is a guy you need to pick up, believe it or not. Um, I, he's, he's a good receiver and, uh, and so is LaVisca and Assault. You got to own these guys. Um, um, Minshew has been a, a surprise. He's, the, the past two weeks, he's been like top 15 quarterback. And so, and he's getting the ball to these guys, but Jark, um, he's not as far ahead of those other receivers in, in in usage that's my that's kind of what i learned is that uh, Chark is not is not f- too far ahead of his his uh fellows on the team yeah yeah uh, I, I think that's yeah. a good point uh it, target percentage is is down real far like i think i brought it up on uh, maybe it was this podcast maybe it was joe's uh it's uh, it's starting to strike me that Minshew is not necessarily a guy who locks into his wide receiver one and he's just going to throw to whoever's open Hey, whatever works. Yeah, he's, I mean, it, it's working. He's playing well, fantastic. Yep, surpassed twenty. I think he's been a, t- a QB one both both weeks. He he topped twenty points both weeks. I think that put him QB uh, as you know a top twelve QB both weeks. I'll have to double check that. But yeah, Jags offense not as uh not as bad as everybody thought it was going to be. No, that's uh, great. Can I take a second? And why why in the world did the Raiders just on their own seventeen yard line with seventeen seconds left and one timeout? Or sorry, on the opponent's seventeen yard line, they ran a draw play. They were really trying to help my Scott Fishbowl team. What in the world was that? They really I, wanted Josh Jacobs to get in for my Scott Fishbowl team. That, that's the only to, thing I could think of. You might be able to tell I have the over. <laughs> the main thing is you did. Oh, don't tell me if you got stuffed around because I'm. Well, well, it doesn't matter. I'll watch the game. What a terrible play call. Okay. All right. Sorry. Uh, I'll have to see no, it later. <laughs> good to talk about. Uh, Kevin, what did you learn outside of the Raiders play calling is iffy at best? Uh, yeah, I learned um, a lot of the backfield situations are, are just simpler than we thought. Like, we were overthinking a lot of them. Uh, the Packers, for sure. Um, absolutely no concerns at, at all about Aaron Jones and, and DJ, AJ Dillon. Uh, that's his job. Um, the Browns, you know, they kind of sorted themselves out a little bit. In a neutral game script, it looks like they're both going to be, it's going to be like 60-40 Chubb Hunt, which is almost kind of what we expected. Uh, again, you, you just can't really take anything from playing Baltimore. Um 
So that that backfield kind of sorted itself out. The Colts backfield sorted itself out. Uh, I don't know if we're going to talk about my Naheem Hines. I don't really think it's worth it. Jonathan Taylor is obviously the guy there. Um, so while there are some interesting running back, you know, situations that that we still don't really have a grasp on, there are some that you know are just simpler than than we made it out to seem. Uh, I I guess I can build off that. Uh, the one complicated backfield that nobody could figure out was the Patriots, and the answer to that is Cam Newton is the running back. Uh, Cam is all the way back. This is my observation for the week. He's all the way back. He takes all the goal line rushes. He's the leading rusher the first two weeks. Uh, yeah, this is his backfield. He's the quarterback. He's MVP Cam is back. And if it wasn't for Russell Wilson throwing five touchdowns, then I would have had a much better night last night. But <laughs> it, it was a fantastic game. I can't complain. Like, Cam, yeah, you, you can't, like, you no. can't complain. You were one. You, I, I saw it on Twitter. You basically lost rock, paper, scissors on the goal line. And, and yeah. it happens, you know. At, at the end of the day, you do know you're competitive enough, and that that's kind of all that matters. Yeah, fantastic game. <laughs> yeah, it was a Cam good game. Back game. Great. Uh, Cam, R- Cam. Ryan Pace should be fired immediately for actually giving up value for Nick Foles, as opposed to just signing Cam for free. Yeah, that's that's a bad one. I mean, it's not just Ryan Pace. It's no, but that's that's the most glaring one I can think of. Whoa, hold on. The Bears are two and zero. How dare you? Uh. Come on now. <laughs> the the, the bad pages are one and one. Let's look at the stats. Okay? Two and oh, one and one. You oh, wins mouth. guy. Here we go. Yeah, you shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let the Bears play the Seahawks and see what happens. Uh, well, yeah, I got nothing there. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our, uh, I guess, our, our moving on up segment. Uh, Richard, who is uh, moving up for you this week? Well, I've got uh, I've got another. Uh, I'm couple, talking about a couple of Robinsons today, but the first one who is moving on up for me is James Robinson. He owns that backfield. Now, this is again, I'm talking about the guys from Duval County, uh, the Jaguars again, um, the team that's supposed to tank, but it looks like the Jets are going to be the tankers. But uh, James Robinson it's, looks really good. I mean, actually starting to get him to involved in the passing game now. It's he's they're gradually working him in for more and more work. And then, and let's face it, the past two weeks the guy is. I mean, you're starting him. He's you're starting James Robinson every week. You don't have to you, you take him out of your take him out of your stash. Uh, unstash James Robinson. Put him in there with confidence. Um, you can even start him as an RB two, and uh, you, you you could it, the floor is there. There the floor is there. So um, start James Robinson. Um, he's moving on up for me. He's he's doing well. All right, and uh, Kevin, who you got? I know we just discussed him, but who's moving up for you? Oh, yeah, Cam Newton is moving all the way up my quarterback board. Um, the passing, the arm is is still there. He's still got a cannon, got a laser of an arm. He's throwing darts all over the field. Um, I, I guess it's finally you know when you when you pair him with a good offensive line and an offensive coordinator who's aggressive and can take advantage of his skill set. It doesn't really matter what receivers he has back there. Um, and on top of that, the rushing is is just exactly what we've wanted to see. Is he's still going to get every single goal line carry? He's going to get add in twelve rushes just by himself. The guy is he's back to being comfortably a, at least a matchup proof quarterback. I, I don't really know where he fits in the in my rankings yet, but he I I will for sure say he's matchup proof. I, I don't really care who he's playing; he's going to be fine as a starter. And pretty with impressive. That, I don't. I actually don't remember seeing. I don't remember Julian Edelman running so many deep routes uh, mm-hmm. in a single game. Just seeing him having to go more than six yards down the field was shocking. I mean, it tells you something when in his second game with Cam Newton, he puts up a career high in reception yards. Yeah. And he, what he played like nine years with Brady. Like I, this is not a knock on Brady at all, but it's just it's just an interesting observation. Yeah, it's a completely different offense. It's so much fun to watch. Um, as opposed to the second half of last year when we were just getting stomped, uh, couldn't create anything. The pass just nothing no. all year long. This is so and, different. And not just his running, but his throwing too. I mean, there's. I kept looking like I kept watching his shoulder because he's had a shoulder problem for long. Nothing. It's not there. Nope. No issues whatsoever. The dude has a his can. The, he was lasering stuff yep. into super tight windows. <laughs> no shoulder issue, none, none whatsoever. <laughs> nope. Um, I guess my moving on up then. Uh, guess keeping with the cam thread. Uh, DJ Moore in Carolina. Uh, without McCaffrey, I think DJ Moore is going to be the guy even more so. Uh, through two weeks, he's you know fourth in the NFL in targets. He's fifth in air yards, and now without the uh, you know the top two way offensive player in the league uh teddy bridgewater is going to lean on him even more he was more is already a wide receiver one 
and now he's gonna gonna soak up even more targets. I think if you can get him at like a wide receiver two, like low one price, I think he's gonna exceed that. While McCaffrey's out, you can uh, make a huge profit over the next you know four to six weeks or however long it takes uh, CMC to come back in. Can I also say too that uh, Curtis Samuel is a sneaky pickup? I can definitely say that, especially if he gets some carries. I think it'd be interesting. Sneaky pickup, uh, Curtis Samuel. Does he get the RB designation like Cordero Patterson did? Mm, don't know I, about I that, but, so. but <laughs> no, uh, I don't think any, anything is like no one's quick enough on that. Uh, we should uh, message Josh Levy in our F six P chat. Tell Sleeper might do it, but yeah, tell, tell Sleeper to do it. I bet my life, NFL and ESPN don't put him there. All right, uh, let's move on to panic. And uh, Kevin, why don't you start with first with your with your panic? Um, yeah, so my panic is is Zach Ertz. Um, I'm not. I'm not concerned about the targets or anything like that, but I, I am concerned that this offense is just not clicking. It's not he's not scoring or the Eagles are not scoring. And I think to have a valuable tight end, you need him to at least score seven touchdowns on the season. And I, I'm I'm struggling to see how that's going to happen um, with the Eagles struggling as much as they are. Uh, Miles Sanders is back now and he had 25 touches on day one. Um, the receiver, the receiving group is only going to get healthier. Dallas Goddard is clearly a factor in there. So Ertz is is not the target monster he's been in the past, and it's I, I'm I, I'm pretty comfortable saying that there's almost no way he's going to return his you know fifth round draft value at this point. And and not only that, when you have Wentz isn't playing very well right now, and that doesn't help. Hopefully the offensive line can improve because Wentz, well, he's holding the ball way too long, but he's getting hit a lot. So hopefully with some improved offensive line play, the whole the whole offense there can uh, can kind of pick it up. Uh, Richard, who's your panic? Uh, it's going to be the Bears. Uh, Allen Robinson. Um, he's getting. Uh, I mean, he's. Uh, I'm a bit kind of worried about him, it's especially for where people were drafting him, and I, and I couldn't understand that actually when when it was coming up. I don't have the exact numbers up here. I'm just getting up as uh, what he's done in the past two weeks. Um, let's see, yeah, Allen Robinson here, just getting just getting his numbers up here. Um, in two games, 18 targets, eight receptions, 107 yards. I mean, that's not really what I mean. It, if, we, if we're looking at a game by game basis, though, um, he's had nine targets each in both games. No, no touchdowns, but 33 yards um, against the Giants. I mean, I know the Bears are two and zero somehow, but um, David Montgomery is emerging, and and actually, you know, even worse than Allen Robinson. Uh, um, and I'm going to talk about this guy later too. Um, is is the, the, the passing game is just. Yeah, it's 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 ugly out there for for Allen Robinson uh, owners right now. Got to be feeling a little bit um, stiffed on the pick that they uh, chose for. I think he was like second or third round. So you're not. I think towards towards the towards week one, I think he was creeping up into like the top of round three, end of round two. Uh, which I know Joe, Joe was huge on him, but I never. Uh, I, like like I showed earlier, I just can't trust the Bears for for anything, even though they're two and zero. Sorry, yeah. yeah don't, always, good. yeah. You gotta say they're two and zero. Okay, show them their proper respect. Give them their due. They're two and zero. Mitch Trubisky is a better quarterback than Cam Newton at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. Why you guys say these things to me? Come on. Uh, it's, 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 hurt I will say this about Trubisky: he's starting off better than uh, you know. He's keeping his team in the game, but I think it's actually the defense that. It's doing it, but, but he's playing better. No, no, no question about it. But Cam, Cam is Cam now. Cam's the no, Cam. Cam is Cam is super Cam again. Super oh, Cam. Yeah, Cam is back, and he's yeah. so damn cool. He's <laughs> so cool. Uh, you guys always have to ruin it. You always have to ruin it. <laughs> what are we ruining? I don't think we're ruining anything. Cam is oh, yeah. oh, all this. Don't you just love last year? Everybody wanted the Patriots to lose. Everybody wanted the dynasty to fall apart. Now that super cool Cam is here, everybody's suddenly rooting no, for no, the no, Patriots. No, 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 no. This is the best. No, no. incorrect, incorrect. This nope. week is exactly what I wanted. Cam balls out, the Patriots lose. That's perfect. <laughs> Damn it. I'm still rooting against the Patriots. Don't get me wrong. Oh, everybody's rooting for the Patriots now. No, everybody's no, cheering no, for the no. Cam Newton Patriots. No, no, no. Everyone's rooting, rooting, uh, everyone's rooting for Cam. I'm rooting for Cam. The Patriots can go, you know, for 1 in 15 <laughs> for all I care. 
Uh, we play the Jets twice. I don't think we're going one in fifteen. You heard what I said. One in fifteen. Oh God. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna make that make that call that you did a couple of years ago. If the Pats go one in fifteen, I will not be on this show. <laughs> make that same call. I think you're a little safer than I was. Yeah, Cam's gonna get hurt next week. Knock on wood. I, I saw a tweet that was like, um, what did it say? It said, yeah, it's cool that the Patriots offense is exciting and all, but just imagine if Jared Stidham had been healthy. 2-0. 2-0 would have been 2-0. Oh. Yeah, score, score to combine 20 points. All right, I'll go on to my panic now. Uh, it's Joe Mixon. Um, even playing, you know, the Bengals ran, what did they run, like 90-something snaps against the Browns on Thursday, and he only got... Uh, you know, he got four targets when Burrow threw the ball 61 times. Uh, he got 16 carries and averaged 2.8 yards against the Browns. He's just, he's not, he's not doing it for me. Um, he's not being really used in the passing game. Uh, he's inefficient behind a terrible offensive line. And if anybody's willing to give you anything close to what you paid, probably a, a first rounder or an early second rounder, you, I think it's time to jump ship on, on Joe Mixon. He's doing the exact same thing he did last year. And I don't see him uh, having a miracle final six weeks like he did last year. Not this time. Well, I, I can't disagree with that. Uh, Joe Mixon is yeah, pretty scary right now for where he drafted him. He's drafted first round too. So uh, he, he started creeping up to the end of the first uh, as the as draft season went on. Still too high. Oh, yeah. Kevin, I heard a sigh over there. Division rival. What's uh, yeah, the Joe Mixon I mean- thought here? I love Joe Mixon's talent. I love his offense. So theoretically, you know, one plus one should equal two and he should be good. I'm just not really sure what exactly is happening because uh, I, I don't think maybe it's an offensive line thing. Maybe it's a Giovanni Bernard thing. I, I really want to watch these games and see exactly what Joe Mixon's doing because I, I feel like he still has a little bit of value. I wouldn't give him away for nothing, but if someone's willing to give you like Kenyon Drake, maybe like I, I probably would take that, but I wouldn't give him away for like you know James Robinson and some trash or something like that. Yeah, for sure. He's, he's still, unlimited. you know, he's still the lead back there. Gotta be unlimited. <laughs> Here comes Mr. Unlimited. Uh, Mr. I guess it's my unlimited. turn to choose this week. Gotta be unlimited. I want to talk about my nominee, and, and you guys go, did all that gibber and gabbing about, and <laughs> believe it or not, I think Cam Newton, I'm nominating Cam Newton for uh, for Mr. Unlimited this week. For all the reasons, I know you've guys, we've talked to him about this, but I mean, the fact of the matter, he kept, the, the Patriots in the game against an insanely hot quarterback with brimming with confidence and he kept them in the game and he nearly he nearly ruined Russell Wilson's great day I mean they were one play away from just ruining it for the Seahawks and it would have been just well you would have loved it Jono I know that but but the fact of the matter is is that Cam Newton uh I have to say I completely agree he's missed he is my nominee for Mr. Unlimited this week uh, I'm going to go with another QB since I don't want to nominate Cam twice. Uh, I'm going to go with Dak Prescott. Uh, the Cowboys are pretty much left for dead in the game against the Falcons. Uh, they came back one at 40 to 39. Dak was QB one this week, threw for 450 yards and ran for three touchdowns, uh, 18 yards, just willed the Cowboys back into that game. I know the Falcons are not from blowing leads, but that was just incredible performance to, uh, to prevent the Cowboys from going 0 2. Yeah, it's hard to hard to argue with either of those picks. But um, it was the onside but, kick, really. The onside <laughs> kick was hilarious. Oh my god, <laughs> I, I, that's something I will not forget for a long time. Just all the Falcons players standing there. Um, Classic Falcons. Mister Unlimited of the week for me. Uh, I'm not. I'm not leaving it just in quarterbacks' hands. I'm extending it to all positions. That being said, I do think Cam Newton should be disqualified for not winning his game. Mister Unlimited is all about winning games. All right. Russell Wilson doesn't play to, to, to lose. Uh, that being said, my Mr. Unlimited of the week is Aaron Jones. The dude just balled out. 15 carries for 168 yards. Caught four of eight targets for 68 yards and another touchdown. How do, I think he had like a 44 point uh, PPR, half PPR game. Just an absolute blow up game for him. And um, with Devontae Adams out, like we, it's a chance we might eat, like he might not fade like we thought he would. Yeah, I mean, uh, he had 45.6, uh, 45.6 PPR points. That's nasty. Um, he has three 40 plus point games since week five of last season, which is just insane. Like, what, what is that? Like 12 games and he's got three 40 point games. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, I've got a tweet from, um, this, this guy I follow on, I don't know how I follow him. Um, sorry. His name is Chris something Montago. 
uh, let me look for it. Chris Man- Mangano. Uh, I've got a tweet from him. So since 2016, the overall PPR running back one has at least uh, on pace for 219 attempts, 0.21 targets per route run, 1.68 yards per route run. And in week two, there's only one running back who's on pace to do this, and it is Aaron Jones. So fair chance he ends up as the wide uh, running back one this season. Yeah, he's making us making everybody look stupid for thinking AJ Dillon was actually going to be a part of this backfield. I I don't understand NFL GMs. Like th- I think I just need to realize that NFL GMs are not as smart as I am because I wouldn't draft the running back <laughs> in the second round, and if I was the Seahawks, I wouldn't draft Rashad Penny in the first round. No, I don't understand. I don't get it. I, just, I don't know what they're doing. Draft a wide receiver. Imagine this. Imagine this Packers offense with uh, I don't know the Visca Chenault out there, or or Michael Pittman, or whoever the hell. Why yeah. the hell did they take AJ Dillon? <laughs> I don't know. Well, they're getting ready for Aaron Jones to leave, so they're grooming Dillon for next year. That's the only reason I can possibly think of to blow a second round pick on him and just not use him whatsoever. And, and I'm not gonna lie, I would respect it. And don't forget, do. don't forget Love too. Uh, back up the Love too. Yeah, Jordan Love. They took him over. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't. I think a lot of people, both the good wide receivers, went before him. But the point is, what the hell are they doing? I don't know. <laughs> Well, the Packers have not drafted Jordan a, Love just, a wide receiver just, in the first for for how long now? What was that? The record? Like it's like seven years or something. They haven't drafted a first round wide receiver. It's I can't I can't even think of the last one they would have drafted. Yeah, it's not 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 ideal if you're trying to you know help out your Hall of Fame QB. But what do I know? I'm not an NFL GM. I'm just a dude that loses fantasy leagues. <laughs> can't I can't relate. Well, you won yeah. this week, so beat me this week. So that's a feather in your cap because I'm hard beat. First one this year. They first have- not drafted a first round wide receiver. Oh, that, no, Randall Cobb was a second round pick since uh, Jordy Nelson was a second round pick. 36, though, so that kind of almost counts. Uh, since Javon Walker in 2002. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, I don't, I don't know who that is. <laughs> Jeez, okay. Why not? Uh, all right. Are we going to do uh, a little bit of waivers this week, or are we just going to uh, be set with the with the injury waivers? How yeah, we well, we kind of – I think we should just move on because we're getting close to the end of the show because we kind of well, covered a lot of the – a lot of the uh, – besides, I'll put uh, – I, you've got your waiver column t- tomorrow that everybody can go and see all these juicy pickups. Yeah, yes. we're, we're going to need to have a talk because I have a lot of options and I, I don't really know what, what to do. Yeah. All right. Sh- shameless plug. My waiver piece is coming out tomorrow morning. So check it out. Uh, Richard, why don't you start us off with your drop? Anthony Miller, drop him if you need space. Yeah. There's, I don't know. I think every year we kind of hope Anthony Miller would go back to what he did two two years ago and be the touchdown king of the Bears, but it's not happening. It's not happening. Everybody thought he was a you know a good late round pickup. He's a good late round drop. <laughs> not doing anything worse actually than uh, Allen Robinson if that can, if uh, if that means anything. Although I will say Alan, uh, Anthony Miller did score a touchdown, but I just don't see it happening for him. Uh, uh, there's there's another guy who's playing ahead of him as well. Um, you don't have him on your uh, waiver list either. Mooney? Mooney, yeah. I'm not trusting the second slash third wide receiver <laughs> no, on the Bears. No. I, not, not a chance. No, I mean, but I'm not going to tell other people to pick him up either. That, that <laughs> seems cruel. <laughs> not sit right in my heart. Yeah. I don't I, think I, my, my issue with Anthony Miller, and I do think he is a talented guy, is just that uh, that Bears passing attack is not consistent enough. It's not even consistent enough really to support Allen Robinson, except that he's amazing at football. So I just I don't know how they're going to support two guys week to week. Like, I think in best ball, Anthony Miller was a great pick because at the end of the season, he'll probably have like 900 yards and, and six touchdowns. But I, when are you ever, I don't know when to start him. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. With with Miller, you just have to start and hope that, you know, it's one of the weeks that he gets into the end zone because right. he, he would have got in this week. He just he dropped it in the end zone. So he had he had the opportunity. He just dropped it, which is a shame. And he ended up putting up zero points. So uh, he'll have his weeks on and off unless Trubisky becomes more consistent, which I don't really see. Uh, all right, Kevin, we've already sort of talked about this, but who's your drop for this week? Yeah, my drop of the week is, is Sonny Mitchell. Uh, I just, he's bad No football. way. Can you drop, how do you drop Sonny Mitchell? Because uh, you, you it, hover it, by the minus sign that's by his, by his name and you click it. And then when it says, are you sure <laughs> you want to drop him? You double click. Okay. <laughs> and then you make sure that he's not on your roster anymore because he's bad at football. And on top of that, he's, he's out of, he's out of chances after two weeks. 
No, uh, yeah, I mean, Damian Harris is coming back next week. I, that's not something to be, you know, glossed over. On top of that, uh, again, it's just Sonny Michelle, his biggest trait was just that he scored touchdowns in a fantastic offense. And now Cam Newton is scoring all those touchdowns. Um, mm. yeah, it's just, uh, there's no, absolutely no value in holding on to Sonny Mitchell. If you're holding on to him, it's because he was a first round pick in what, 2018. And it's just not worth it. Yeah, I can, I can attest to that. Um, Sonny Michelle's value, like you said, was scoring touchdowns and being the goal line guy. For, for Tom Brady, but now that Cam is there, it's Cam at the goal line, and that's it. There's Sony wasn't even a thought at the end of the game. Like it, that that's all this is, and you you can safely drop Sony because he can put up 15 yards on you know six carries as easily as he can put up a goal line score. Uh, totally on board with the Sony drop. <laughs> I guess I am too. You can't talk me into it. Well, it wasn't too hard to talk me into it, but I kind of I just kind of thought that seeing Sony Michelle's name up there, I thought mm, you're not going to give him at least one more week. Uh, no. Absolutely no. not. I wasn't even ready to draft him at all. So this is uh, long overdue for me. Mm, this is true. All right. I'll go with my drop. It's uh, Austin Hooper. Easy. Uh, big money signing for the Browns in the offseason. And just isn't really doing anything. Yeah. Even with David Njoku out, Hooper, you know, he only had four targets last week uh, in a high scoring game against the Bengals. Um, just not really doing anything. Uh, I didn't. Uh, didn't really notice him on the field uh, for the game. He only had 22 yards. Didn't really make a huge impact. So, and doesn't he's, fit the what, scheme. Yeah, he's the, the he's the number five option behind OBJ, Jarvis Landry, Nick Chubb, and Kareem Hunt. He's the fifth option at best, and he's not going to be consistent enough with you know Baker Mayfield being a little inconsistent himself to be startable any given week. So Austin Hooper, easy drop for me. Yeah, yeah, he's not good. At, he, he's not. He's not that great. I don't know what's going on. I think. If he was Maybe. in Atlanta, still he'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to couch that. He's not that great with Baker, and I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what's going on. Maybe he'll bounce back like OBJ did, but um, he's definitely not going to be a tight end eight or whatever he was drafted as. Yeah. Um. All right, let's move on to the final uh, final oh, seg- can segment. I give my, can I give my spec ads? Yeah, do it. Oh, I don't know why I cut you off. I thought we were already in spec ads. All We're, right, Richard, make was... a note. Make a note. Edit me rudely cutting Jonathan off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking it over, I man. You skipped me for the spec ads, and I was like, hold on. I have like 50. But I mean, the last book uh, you talked about was Sony Michelle, so they're only pick one. It's your spec ad. I've got a Patriot as a spec ad. Oh, beautiful. Okay, uh, so yeah, run it back. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> right. Let's move on to our last segment of the week. Uh, let's go with our spec ads. Uh, Kevin, you're very enthusiastic about this. Why don't you give us your first spec ad for the week? All right. Yeah, my first one. Yeah, okay. I've got it. <laughs> Buckle up. Got so about. many. Two dozen. Uh, where to start? I'll start since, you know, I, I besmirched your Patriots uh, and, and told everyone to drop Sonny Michelle. Uh, speculation ad to Mary Bird. Uh, rocking Josh Gordon's old number. Always nice to see. Uh, nice tribute to the GOAT. Um, he is, I, I think this is kind of like a, a buy into the Patriots offense. Again, it's it's Cam Newton. He's the real deal. We all, I've said that enough times this show. Uh, I think Richard's already sick of that. But um, he's he's playing 85%. Hey, I bought in. I'm in. I'm in on Cam Newton. I'm right in. Yeah. Yeah. And Demary Bird is playing 85% of the snaps uh, yeah. opposite Nikhil Harry and Julian Edelman. And what that tells me is that the Patriots are going to, uh, you know, 11 personnel. They're going out there. No tight end. I don't know who the hell their tight end is. Uh, maybe the rookie Devin Asad, but whatever. They're not, he's not a pass catcher. So whenever they actually have to go score the ball, they're running out three wide receiver set, which means that their wide receiver three has some kind of value. And Demary Bird, yeah, he's tiny, but caught six and nine targets for 72 yards. I don't think it can be ignored considering, you know, Nikhil Harry is, is probably not that consistent. And um, uh, again, it's just a kind of a buy in on Cam. Never a bad thing to buy in on Cam. Uh, Richard, who's your spec ad? I'm going to say Travis Homer, um, mainly because if there's any injury, it's obvious that Travis Homer is the next one up. Now, Rashad Penny might come back at some point during the season so I'm on the pup list right now. So, um, But, um, yeah, I think you can stash Travis Homer if uh, anything happens to Chris Carson or um, great punt returner, uh, a kick returner, and uh, he shows that he's got speed and uh, carried a few balls. He's um, he's a good um, he's a good uh, spec ad if you want to uh, um, if you've got room on your roster and you and there's nobody else to grab in a deeper league. Uh, Travis Homer's Travis Homer's quite worth it. Yeah, especially with the uh, the Seahawks offense moving as uh, as seamlessly as it is. Um, my spec ad is going to be KJ Hamler uh, for the Broncos. Played his first game. Uh, this Sunday against Pittsburgh, uh, surprisingly got seven targets in his first action, uh, mostly with Jeff Driscoll at the, uh, at the helm, which is nice moving forward. Uh, the Broncos spent a second round pick on him. 
Uh, they plan to use him. He's got you know good athlete, got good speed, and if anybody can break out behind Jerry Judy, I don't. And no offense, uh, Hamler's got a chance. He had some buzz coming into the season. Uh, now that he's healthy and playing, uh, it's an upside stash. But uh, if he gets the targets, I don't see why he wouldn't be able to to break out if he has some some chemistry with Jeff Driscoll. Yeah, I, I like it, especially with Cortland Sutton going on, like you said. So. Yeah, I, I'm. I've been. I was looking. He was on my list. I'm going to look into Jeff Driscoll's old statistics and see how much he targets slot receivers. Yeah. But John, oh, there's something that you forgot to do. You've got you. We've made our nominations for Mr. Unlimited. Gotta be unlimited. Well, you heard all the uh, oh, nominations. I didn't name one. Oh, right. You've got to name um, a Mr. Unlimited from all their discussions. Did we sway you? I, or are you going to go with your... Should I be a homer or should I do it? Should I give it to the guy who actually deserves it? Mm. No, I'll, I'll stick half with Kevin here. Cam didn't win his game, so I can't really give him Mr. Unlimited, although he did play great. I'm going to give it to Jones. Uh, 46 point PPR performance uh, just completely shredded the Lions, uh, setting records in the process. I'm giving it to Aaron Jones. Just incredible performance. And like you said, could finish as, you know, the entire season's RB1. Mr. Uh, by, the, by the way, we Mr. do need to shout out the real Mr. Unlimited. Yeah. <laughs> we should point out that Russell Wilson, not, not by any means, he could have been a candidate, and I wouldn't have blinked twice. Throw for 255 yards and five touchdowns. Uh, the guy was a monster. I mean, I've never seen... Dude, Russell throws the, the prettiest deep balls I've ever seen. I think he could throw me open on a go route. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he, he did play great, but Cam, Cam was right there. Yeah, there was people's better. He somehow finished quarterback four on this week. Yeah, he actually time. Cam actually finished ahead of Russell. Yeah, rushing Check. touchdowns will do that. Wanted to give Russell yep. Mr. Unlimited a shout out. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to give it to him two weeks in a row, so no, I can't. It's his own it. award. Yeah. yeah All right. Well, well that's and that's it for our our segments. Uh, either you guys have any final thoughts for the week? Anything going into week three that uh, that you want to get off your chest? Well, I hope, just hope there's uh, a lot more people coming back than going out this week. <laughs> So uh, we're gonna we're gonna. St- I think the final thoughts here is is that we're kind of expecting a few players back, and uh, which is kind of good. So it, like Galladay will be back, and uh, a couple of others. But I think everybody's kind of looking forward because Galladay hasn't hasn't even been in a game yet, and so we're kind of waiting to see what he looks like. So that's that's kind of my final thought is I'm kind of looking forward to Galladay. See what he's see if he's gonna live up to his uh, value. Yeah, I definitely see if that'll help Matt Stafford and the uh, struggling Lions. The- um, oh, I guess I probably should mention uh, Leonard Fournette. Uh, sort of taking over the backfield in Tampa. That's pretty important news that we didn't mention. Um, over 100 yards, two touchdowns. After Ronald Jones fumbled the handoff, messed that up. Arians blamed him. Brady blamed him. Kind of got benched. If so you the picture, Ronald Jones had his arms the wrong way. Yeah. Like, you know, Just. you receive a ball, right hand up, left hand up, depending on where it's coming from. He had his arm. That's like a junior high mistake, man. Yeah. We'll see if the benching lasts into week three, but Fournette did everything he could to, to take that job. So we'll, uh, I think, yeah. I think, well, and he did start it well. him now. Yeah. Anyways, I think that ends it for us. Uh, uh, for the Fantasy Edge week two uh, wrap up, week three preview. I'm Jonathan Chan for Richard Seville, Kevin Huo. We will see you uh, next week. Great. That's a wrap.